Thank you, Ms. Talbot. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Appreciate the, the very beautiful special music. Hope you all had a good Thanksgiving. <clears throat> As we are gathered here, when we think about who we are, coming from many backgrounds, many walks of life, and yet somehow thrown together as one group, all because God chose us to be here. He's not yet chosen our neighbors. They're still cutting the lawn today, or maybe still shopping, you know, hangover from uh, Black Friday yesterday. Uh, maybe they're at work. They're not here today, but we are, because God has chosen us to be a part of the first fruits. And brethren, on this Thanksgiving weekend, as we are thinking about what we're thankful for, as Mr. Wakefield mentioned that, out of all the things that we're thankful for, way up at the top of the list certainly is our calling. Our calling. Why we're here today. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. Let's turn over there. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, we read, He says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, and we who are baptized, who are walking this way of life, who are here, we have tasted this way of life, and it's good. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God, and precious, you also as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He says in verse 9, you are a chosen generation, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. If you have King James, I think it says peculiar people. And yes, some of us are kind of peculiar too. <clears throat> Some more peculiar than others. Actually, all of us are. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. And he's quoting from Hosea, and he's referring to the fact that the ancient Israelites, who were God's people, who had obtained mercy when they rebelled, they lost it. And they ceased to be his people. They ceased to be chosen. But we have been chosen as a nation that God is working with, a spiritual nation. And he is comprising a people today. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. And in particular, ask the question, why? Why did God choose you? Why did God choose you? If we are a chosen nation, a chosen generation, brethren, why did God choose you? Fill in your name. You know, the short answer is, we don't know. The shorter answer is, not many wise and not many noble are called. The short answer is, we don't bring anything to the table that's beneficial to God, do we, in that sense. And yet, he has called us. He has brought us into a relationship with him. So what are the reasons why he has chosen you? Let's talk about several today as we're thinking about what we're thankful for, as we're thinking about our thanksgiving, <clears throat> number one, number one, God has chosen you, God has chosen us 
because he knows you can be put to work. He's chosen you because he knows you can be put to work. You know, some people are hard workers. Some people you can give a job to and you can walk away. And you know whether you're gone an hour or two hours or a day or a week, you know they're going to work. You know they're going to work on what you gave them to do. They're not eye pleasers. They are a joy to work with because they work hard. Brethren, we know the primary reason for the existence of the church today is to do the work. So if he called you today, he sees in you a willingness to work and a potential to work even more, to roll up our sleeves and get to work. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, he said, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Not our own works, not our own doings, not of ourselves. We don't earn our salvation. We're not confused about that. But brethren, we were chosen to work. And if God called you at this time, in the end time, in the last days, he sees in you and he sees in me a willingness to work. Not just to sit on our hands and watch the world go by. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20 in verse, verse 1. There's an interesting parable here that Jesus Christ gives. <clears throat> he says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard and they went to work. Verse 3, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went, and again he went out the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise, and about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. You know, when you think about it, <clears throat> that's what most people in this world are doing spiritually. Just standing idly by, just marking time. They may be very busy. They may be doing a lot of things. They may be active. Their days may be full. There may be a lot of activity. But what are they really accomplishing spiritually? They're going around and around in circles, and it Unless we had been called out of that, we would be as well. Brethren, when we were chosen to be part of God's team, it gave our life meaning, didn't it? That we didn't have before. It gave it purpose. A reason to drive ourselves every day. A reason to get up every day and take a cold shower if need be, you know. If there's no hot water. Because we're part of the greatest work on earth. And you know, in, in hard times, in times of loss, as the Meredith's are going through right now, a reason for being makes all the difference. A reason for going on makes all the difference. Doing the work all the way up until Christ's return and then seeing our loved ones again. It makes all the difference. And isn't it much more exciting to be working than to be those just sort of standing around in the marketplace? He hired them. He put them to work. And then, of course, as, you, as we just read, he went back into the marketplace later, and he was hiring people all the way to the end of the day. That's also interesting and inspiring, knowing that God 
is going to be choosing additional workers right up to the end, right up to the very end. You know, those of you who have been called out, those of you who have come into contact with God's church just a year or two or three or four ago, your calling is just as important and just as significant as those who have been around for 40 or 50 years. And it's interesting, even at the end of the story, how Christ makes it very clear that his focus was not on the payment. You remember? The, the, those who had been in the, in the field all day long and had borne the heat of the day all day long, and then they got the same amount that the one that was just there for an hour got. And they were upset, and he said, Look, I've not done you wrong. I paid you fairly. My focus was to get the job done. That's what I wanted to do. And that's why we're here. God wants people who have a mind to work. And even, even who aren't comparing themselves with, well, you know, are you going to get a denarius? Well, I've been in here a little bit longer. Well, maybe I should get, you know, two denariuses. Two denarii. Two, uh, what is the plural of a denarius? I don't know. Brethren, God has chosen us in this time to work. And if he, we are a part of God's church today, and if the Father has called us, he sees in us an ability and a potential to work. Christ said to his disciples, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask in the Father in my name, he will give you. And he is still calling out the Father is, through Jesus Christ, disciples to this day. You know, it's interesting. It's obvious that first-generation Christians have been specifically picked by God, called out of the world. That's the way their calling was. But what about second-generation Christians? Are they just along for the ride? Have they just come in on the coattails of their parents? Our grandparents, you know, this can be difficult for those who are second generation Christians. Is it sort of like God says, well, as long as you're here, you might as well come along too. Or like you remember on the playground when they're picking teams for the softball or kickball game and all the best players are picked and you get down to the last person. And they're, you know, each one is saying, you, you can take him. No, that's okay. You take him. You take him. You take him. Have you ever been that person? Is that sort of like what it's, it's like for second generation Christians that God says, well, okay, I, mean, I don't, you're just standing there looking awkward. You might as well come on the team. Or is God going to be doing a work all the way until the end, and therefore he needs and he wants people willing to work all the way until the end. And that means as another generation comes forward, just like the children of Israel, as they were preparing the second generation to go into the land, their job was significant and important. And they had to stand up and stand strong and stand in the gap. Young people, if you are a second generation Christian, the experience is different for you, but the calling is no less significant. You are being chosen today as well. And God wants you on his team. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> He's putting together a team of people who have a mind to work. And you wouldn't be here if he didn't see the potential of you being in the work. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 he says, And he gave himself 
He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. You know what happens to children when you put them to work. No offense to all of you children here. What happens to children when you put them to work? In about three and a half minutes, they're looking for something else to do, right? I was a children once, I, a child once, I understand. You know, being out in the garden and you're picking beans and the beans row goes on into infinity and you think this is going to take forever and the dog comes by. Well, that's more exciting to play with a dog than to pick beans or a butterfly flies by, you know, or a bee or just looking at the dirt. That's interesting to do. God is telling us don't get distracted. As mature Christians, don't be a child spiritually. Don't be distracted by everything that comes along because he says, I want you to have a mind to work. And if you're called today, I see that in you. Brethren, that's powerful. That God sees that in us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. He says, but speaking the truth in love, grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. Every joint supplies. Every joint contributes according to the effect of working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Beautiful picture about how everyone works together in the body of Christ to accomplish his work. So why have you been chosen? Why are you here personally? God sees in you and in me a potential to be a part of his work. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here, brethren. We'd be out mowing our lawn. We'd be at Walmart trying to get one of those big screen TVs that people were wrestling over yesterday, you know? You, have you seen it on YouTube? It's disgusting. Now, brethren, let's keep at it. There's a lot of work left to do. We've only just begun. And God wants people who aren't afraid of work. Why else did God choose you? Number two, God chose you because he knows you can be a good example. He knows you can be a good example. Notice in Deuteronomy chapter 4, ancient Israel, as Mr. Wakefield was, was reading a little bit about the past and about why we've been blessed so enormously in this land, not because of our own doings, but because of Abraham's obedience and mostly because of God's promises and his faithfulness. But this was the word to to Israel that Moses gave to them. He says, verse 5, Surely I have taught you, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5, I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Verse 6, But be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day. Ancient Israel, we know, was supposed to be a model nation, an example to the whole world. 
but they failed. And modern Israel is no better. We just worship the gods of materialism and the gods of the self and the gods of me first. What an example to show the rest of the world. You know, grown men and women fighting over toys. Grown men and women. You know, much of the world does not have a very flattering view of Americans. They think of us as loud, crude, and gluttonous. And you know, the way the media portrays Thanksgiving, why wouldn't they? It's all about stuffing as much turkey in you as you possibly can, and then going shopping. Isn't that sad, brethren? Isn't that sad? And that's the rest of the world's view of Thanksgiving. A holiday, a day that was originally designated, as we heard, to be a time of national thanks to God. What a sad commentary and what a sad example today that our nation has come. But what does God expect from us? Notice in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. We are that people. We are to take the place of that nation. We are to set an example. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Beloved, I beg you, Paul says, as sojourners and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Quite a calling to be told by God that he wants us to be someone he can point to. And he can say, be like him. Or be like her. I want you to look at their example. And be like that person. Brethren, why did God choose you? If he didn't see that potential in you and me. To be an example that he can hold up and show others. God doesn't make mistakes. You know, he, he, he doesn't choose us and then say, ooh, maybe I, maybe I missed on that one. Maybe I was wrong. Ouch. Well, can't win them all, I guess. No. We have to choose to respond, but he doesn't make mistakes. He's not a quitter. He's into success. <clears throat> He's not a failure. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, he says, Christ said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled by men. What do you do with salt that isn't salty anymore? Ladies, how do you cook with salt that isn't salty? Well, it, it's like using curry that isn't curry anymore. You know, what, what do you do with it? You, you throw it out, you replace it, you get some other... Salt that is salty. What is our example like? What if our life was shown up on a big screen here for all of us to see every detail, every moment, every private moment? What would we be like? You know, the time that we're at home, the time we're on the road fighting through traffic, Everything we say to our husband or wife. Everything we say to our spouse or don't say to our spouse. You know, the, the looks that we give one another sometimes. What if that would be up there? What about every private moment? Every private moment, brethren. 
God wants it all to be a good example. Can we handle that? That intense scrutiny. Jesus said, whatever is done in the darkness will be brought to light. That's a lot of pressure. That's heavy. But that's what pillars do, isn't it? They handle pressure. And God would not choose us if he didn't feel like we could handle the pressure. If we couldn't be a good example. <clears throat> you never know who's watching you. Maybe your kids, maybe a coworker, maybe a brother or sister in the church. Whenever you don't know someone's looking, count on it. They're watching your example. We saw a movie uh, a couple of months ago, 42, I think it was, about Jackie Robinson. And a uh, really interesting movie, enjoyed it. Seemed to be historically accurate uh, as much as movies are, uh, from what I've read. <clears throat> but there's one point where Jackie Robinson's pretty discouraged about the abuse he's taking. And he feels like about time to give up. And the manager reminds him, you know, that the eight and the nine and the ten-year-old boys are watching him. And they're watching his every move. And they're starting to mimic him. They're starting to even have the same motions and, and, uh, and, and, and idiosyncrasies as he has when he's up there batting. He says, they're watching you. You can't back out of the pressure now. You're a role model whether you like it or not. Brethren, you, we do not know who's watching us and who is being moved by our example. They may never say it. But someone may be thinking to themselves, you know, I really appreciate that person. The way they handled that situation. We we really are much more moved and inspired by a living example than just by words, by someone who's in the arena, someone who is even struggling with, with trials and difficulties and yet handling it well. So don't think your example is not important. If God has called you to be an example and he would not have brought us into his body today, if he didn't think we could be. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, notice. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. He says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. A pillar takes pressure and holds up the, the, the superstructure of the building. God believes you have what it takes. Not on our own, not on my own, not on your own, but if we yield to him, if we have an attitude of yielding to him, he sees something, and that's why he called us today. Number three, <clears throat> why else did God choose you? God chose you because he knows you can change and overcome. He knows that you and I can change and overcome. We just read in Revelation 3 that the Philadelphians are overcomers. You know, one of the things that we can really appreciate about Dr. Meredith is he is focused and zeroed in on provoking us to change and helping us to change that it's not good enough to stay where we are. And he's been preaching that message for decades, as long as I can remember. And he's focused on it himself. And that's good for us, and that's inspiring for us. We need that. 
It's not perfectionism, it's not getting picky, and it's not getting judgmental on each other, but rather letting God perfect and complete and refine us. Brethren, God would not have brought you and not have brought me to this place today if he didn't think we could change. Revelation 2.26 says, He that overcomes and keeps my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations. All of God's servants have been overcomers through history. You know, Jacob, when he was born, he was called Jacob, the heel grabber, because from the very beginning, he was out to, to, to get the upper hand on the other guy. How would you like that, you know, to, for your whole life to be named heel grabber, competitive guy that wants to bring others down? You know, that, wouldn't that be a nice name to have? And yet he changed. He became different. He was converted. His name changed to Prince with God. Brethren, we all have areas where we need to change and grow. We can sometimes get discouraged because we get in a rut. And we, can't, we think we can't get out of the rut. But God is not discouraged. He would not have chosen us now if he didn't think we could make it. If he thought the road would be too hard for us or our problems too Intractable. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. As we think about our calling and we think about why we're here and we think about our nation that hasn't been called yet, those millions around us and others around the world, and the absolutely precious opportunity we have to be a part of God's work, to be good examples, to learn to be good examples, and to change. Luke chapter 22 and verse 14, this is, of course, the Passover that Jesus kept just before his death. Verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him, and he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he went through the, the symbols that were representing his, his death, the new covenant. And then he talked about the, the betrayer. He said, one of you is going to betray me. And verse 23 is very interesting. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. You know, that's a really nice way of saying we, we might, let, let's infer a little bit, okay? Question among themselves who might do these things. They were pointing fingers. They were saying, yeah, I bet it's him. Yeah, I've, I've known all along it's, it's probably him. Yeah, I, I think I had a bad feeling about so-and-so. They, they might have been doing a little bit of uh, jockeying for voting who was the one that would betray. And then it escalated, verse 24. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them would be considered the greatest. Brethren, what a glorious beginning of the church. What a fantastic start to the body that we are a part of. The body of Christ, the first fruits, those who are going to assist Jesus Christ in reigning over the whole earth. This is how it started. First of all, accusing each other about who is going to betray him. And then visualizing, well, maybe I will be great in the kingdom. You notice that Jesus didn't cast them out. He taught them. Verse 25, and he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, 
and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves, for who is greater, he who sits at the table, or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table, yet I am among you as the one who serves? In verse 28, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials. Verse 29, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed upon one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Brethren, wouldn't this have been a perfect time for Jesus in his mind to think, I've got the wrong 12 guys. I've got to start over. You know, I was going to tell them that they would be reigning over the 12 king, you know, tribes of, uh, of Israel, but I think I'm going to change my mind. Did he believe they could change or not? Does he believe we can change or not? We are their spiritual descendants. They are our, our spiritual forefathers, the apostles in that sense. Would God call us to his church if he didn't think we could make it? Whatever our problems are, whatever the ruts that we get into, whatever the patterns that need to be broken. Brethren, we are two months past the Feast of Tabernacles. After the feast, we were challenged to take what we had learned at the feast and put it into action here at home. Well, here we are a couple of months later as we pause at a, at a time when our nation supposedly pauses for Thanksgiving. Many of them don't really, but it's a good time for us to think about that. And also to think about, as we're in the midst of our labors right now, are we getting discouraged? Are we getting disheartened when this going is slow? Or obstacles present themselves? Or times of loss? as we have had this last week. We must not get discouraged. We must not give in to the feeling that we can't make it. We must not give up. We must not give in. If we need help, we need to ask for help. If we need counseling, we need to ask for counseling. If we need to get rid of bad habits, we need to get rid of the bad habits. Time is too short. Time is running out. We need to know why God chose us. Not because of any great aptitudes and abilities that we have, but because he sees an attitude of yielding to him and obeying him. He can do amazing things in us if we will just yield to him. Let's turn over to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. It's critical, brethren, that we know why we're here. That we know why we're sitting in this group today. Why we're not out there today. And why God looked down and picked us, handpicked us, whether first generation or second generation, why he sees us and why he wants us here. He says in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul because he knows we can change with his help. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. 
Verse 12, who can understand his errors? As our nation goes on a collective binge, as eating as much as they possibly can, we are to ask God to help us to see our errors. Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, every part of me, every fiber of my being be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God has put us in his church today because he sees potential. Are we better than those running up and down, jogging down, up and down the street and going to school and going to work and doing their daily business? Of course not. God will give them the opportunity that we are having someday. But if he chose us today, we must not underestimate that he sees something in us that he wants to use. And that, brethren, is an attitude of being yielded to him. Second Peter, <clears throat> let's turn in conclusion to Second Peter. Chapter 1. He says, Grace and peace be multiplied applied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, more than any material riches, more than any national wealth is what we have been given. We enjoy great blessings materially, but mostly the calling that he has given to us that we could be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence. Add, he says, to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control. There's something we have to do. We've got to work at it. We can't just coast along to self-control, perseverance to perseverance, godliness to godliness, brotherly kindness to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Wow, what an opportunity we have to be like God and to think like God and to have the character like God. But we know that that's the one thing that God cannot, by divine fiat, create in another being, and that is character. They have to choose. So God has chosen us, but now... The choice is ours. What are we going to do with that? Brethren, we are at the end of an age. Time is running out. God is calling a people to do some pretty special things. Those who are being who are willing to yield to him. Those who are willing to have an attitude that will work, that will be a good example and it will change. Peter says, verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Brethren, if God has called us today, he sees potential in us sometimes much more than we see in ourselves. He's called us as his spiritual Israel to lead the world. 
And he believes we can do it with his help. Let's take advantage of this opportunity. Let's not drop the ball. It's an incredible privilege that in this end time, in these last days, in preparation for ruling with him in his kingdom forever, that God has chosen you.